Welcome back everybody to The Economancer. Today's going to be an interesting episode, so to kind of go into this, I'm going to be engaging in a respectful critique of Telos Bounds' most recent video on Descartes and how infrared is right. Now, this very well may not even be a critique, it may just be another way of thinking about it, and I think that that's probably a reasonable interpretation, but it's something that I'm uh, that I really think strongly about is a lot of people give Descartes kind of a bad name. I actually think his work was really, really good. And it's important in the theory of the mind, especially from the stuff that I've done in neuroeconomics, um, as well as, you know, some of the work done by uh, other great philosophers of the mind and theologians in more recent history. <clears throat> so this may just be a different way of looking at it. So essentially, there's an, agree an agreement between Tilos Bound and Hawes uh, with this interpretation of Descartes. And I believe that they've missed the mark in their understanding. So before I get into the content, I want to lay out some quotes from church fathers. So we're going to start with Nemesius of Emissa. So he's a late 4th century bishop in Syria. He's not canonized as a saint, but his writings have been influential in the church. His work of the nature of man was often attributed to St. Gregory of Nyssa, and St. Maximus the Confessor is the first writer to quote his work uh, in the Ambigua, and St. Anastasios incorporated excerpts into his questions and answers, and then St. John of Damascus in 743 incorporated extensive excerpts in his writings in De Fide Orthodoxa. So, to quote, if anyone should think it out of all reasons that a godly man should suffer grievously so that someone else should be put right let him reflect that his life is a contest and a striving ground for virtue the victor's wreaths are splendid in exact proportion therefore to the pains but which they are won that is why paul was allowed to fall into countless afflictions the purpose was that the crown of victory which he should bear might be greater next we're going to be looking at saint gregory the miracle worker I thoughtfully examined and wisely learned the nature of everything on earth. I discovered that it was all very complex, because human beings are allowed to toil away on earth, wallowing about uselessly in various kinds of pretentious efforts at various times. This is from Paraphrase of, paraphrase of Ecclesiastes 1.13. When it comes to, or the next is St. Gregory of Nyssa, when it comes to words about God and searching his essence, there is time for silence. But when it concerns some good operations of which we have knowledge, it is time to speak of God's power, miracles, works, which necessitate words. A creature should not overstep its bounds with regard to transcendent matters, but remain content with knowledge of himself. Homilies on Ecclesiastes 7. Now, towards the end of this, I hope those quotes make sense, but I want to leave those there in your mind so that you can kind of chew on that fat. Next, we're going to be quoting Descartes himself on such matters. I could, not I could not possibly be of such a nature as I am, yet have in my mind the idea of God, if God did not in reality exist. In the context of this quote, Descartes is arguing that his awareness of imperfection and conception of a perfect being, God, could not originate from his imperfect self. The capacity to conceive of God must be implanted by a greater being than him. By doing so, Descartes actually situates the self, the thinking subject, within a broader ontological framework that includes a necessary relationship with a higher divine reality. This allows him to argue that the certainty of our own existence implies the existence of God. This is the essence of Descartes' ontological argument for God's existence. And this is really important to think about. He also goes on to say, God created both myself and everything else. And then, by God I understand a, a substance which is infinite, independent, supremely intelligent, and supremely powerful. So he's saying not by God he understands it, but he's saying by the transcendent thing, God, he understands something that which is beyond understanding, right? And all of this leads into, well, it all follows from cogito ergo sum, which translates to, I think, therefore I am. 
This highlights cognition and awareness, but it doesn't touch on the relationships or connections within knowledge or knowledge production. So let's think about Descartes' proposition as a base of a tower, a foundational point rather than the entire structure. Now, Descartes responded to skepticism. So people need to understand this. Descartes is responding to skepticism by establishing a foundation of certainty through his famous argument, cogito ergo sum. So you can think of it like this. Descartes starts by applying a method of systemic doubt, like those before him, like a detective trying to find one irrefutable fact in a sea of misinformation. So he arrives at the conclusion that while he can doubt the existence of the eternal world, his senses, his body, he cannot doubt that he is doubting, which is like finding a single undeniable truth among the doubts. Thus, the cogito becomes the one thing that is certain and indubitable for Descartes, the bedrock upon, upon which all other knowledge can be built. This is in contrast with the skepticism of his time, which questioned the possibility of certainty about anything. Descartes' response to skepticism is not to deny it outright, but to take it seriously and find a way out of the skeptical predicament. It's like trying to find solid ground amid a sea of quicksand. Once he establishes the certainty of his own existence, Descartes then proceeds to prove the existence of God and the reliability of clear and distinct perceptions, thus rebuilding knowledge that is secure from skeptical doubt. But he does not make the statement that he himself exists without God. He makes it very clear that he only exists in God. That whenever he does this final introspection and he finds himself on the inner being, He's not alone because only something which in contrast, some dialectical movement, if you would, could have created him for him to even consciously think of perfection. That means there must be some perfection, which proves that in his lowest part of himself that he can, you know, reflect on in this, he's not reflecting on himself. He's reflecting on God. So, the second misconception arises from this identification of the subject of Descartes' proposal. Both Tillersbaum and Hawes are referring to a personal who as the subject, which isn't what Descartes intended. It's as if they've mistaken the singer for the song. His focus wasn't on the self, but the mind in response to radical skepticism. Now, my third point is going to be involving an alternative view, drawing from Lumen. I see the mind as a place for psychic inner subjectivity and social inner subjectivity. The philosophy bears some similarities to Zizek's Lacanian unconscious, where the core of subjectivity exists. But I find Lumen's ideas more intriguing as he proposed that the mind is operationally closed, but functionally open. So you can think of this like a country with well-defined borders, but an open immigration policy. The mind processes and interprets environmental information, building its own internal meanings and representations. This allows for individuals to sustain a distinct psychic identity separate from their environment. So while, they may, so while there may be internal conflicts and tensions, the emphasis lies in the self-referential and meaning-making processes of the psychic system. There isn't a struggle, rather an adaptation of these environmental informations by the psychic system. So you can think of this like The Matrix, again, looking at Jean Baudrillard, or The Matrix, the movie, actually. I'm not even worrying about Jean Baudrillard, because that's a whole nother uh, fish to tackle. So the fundamental mistake in this belief is that everything is like socially constructed, and, and that our brains can be forcibly manipulated to accept a certain idea. But if we look at the Matrix, even when they download martial arts skills into Neo's brain, it doesn't reflect any change to, its, to his self. His central nervous system may adjust, but the essence of his self doesn't change. And that is what he is referencing, by he, I mean, uh, Descartes is referencing in his work. It's not the self, but the mind, but, but how we cognize. So 
Now we're going into Zizek. So Zizek's notion of ne negativity is intrinsically linked to his adoption of Hegelian dialectics and Lacanian psychoanalysis. For Zizek, negativity is a structural and inevitable aspect of reality and subjectivity. So this is a reflection of internal conflict, contradiction, and division. The negative is what drives di dialectical movement and transformation. For Zizek, the negative is the disruptive force that allows movement and transformation. For Zizek, this disruptive force allows for the emergence of the new. So in psychoanalytic terms, this negativity can be perceived as the discord between the conscious and the unconscious mind, the struggle between our perceived reality and our repressed desires and fears. Now, Telos Bound works off of this, but he does an amazing job in, in turning this into something more. So Telos Bound posits that sin is the negativity that enters the perfect creation through Adam and Eve's disobedience, and this causes a rift between the self and the other, God. It represents the fall from grace, a deviation from the divine plan, and the disruption of harmonious relations. However, it's important to clarify that this concept of negativity differs significantly from Zizek's conception. In Telos Bound's perspective, negativity is not inherent to the structure of reality or consciousness, but is contingent upon sin and even a st an even or state of being that disrupts the perfect harmony of creation. So this negativity is not what drives transformation, but what hinders unity and wholeness, a rupture that needs healing. So, giving the Lumanian perspective, we have some differences. First, we have the recognition of negativity from the system. When sin introduces negativity into the system, the relationship, the relationship between God and humanity, it, it acts as a form of environmental information or disturb, disturbance. So, if you watch my video on Ashby on stability, the system recognizes this disturbance and processes it through self-referential operations. And again, we're not talking about the self-referential operations of the self. We're talking about the cognizing operations of the self. Just like I was talking about earlier from, from some of the church fathers, there's a reflection on the mind when it comes to understanding. This is what's going on. So the response to the negativity, right? So the, the system has to respond to this uh, increased complexity or what have you. So the system then initiates operations that counteract the effects of this disturbance. So it's going to strive to reestablish a balance or to adapt to the new conditions. This could involve turning away from sin or seeking redemption. This is the negation of negativity, the second negation, right? And so this would be recoil in hegelian terms but in this one we're not necessarily going for this synthesis here but we have transformation finally the system reaches a new state of equilibrium or adaptation this is not a return to the original state before the disturbance but rather a transformed state that incorporates the experiences and effects of the disturbance. It represents a new level of complexity and understanding, a synthesis that transcends and includes the original state and its negation through something like structural coupling or, or something along those lines. Now, the reason why this becomes important to me is orthodox anthropology, in my opinion, argues that without assuming the self as separate from the other, we can't progress towards the other, which goes into some of the other quotes. Because when we're thinking of the self, we have to think that there's like the deep self, which is beyond cognizing, which is beyond what we can possibly think of. And so to put this in like economics terms, I don't know why I want to buy some of the things that I do. I don't know why buying Cheerios enhances or increases my utility versus other cereal. That is probably something to do with how I was raised, something my grandmother might have said, uh, my taste buds that are like particular to me, but all of it is beyond understanding of what I can know about myself. But I also have myself in that I can 
cognize and understand what's going on. And what I can cognize, I have to try to redirect that uh, deep self, that deep me. So in this idea for orthodox anthropology, the self and the other are like two sides of a coin. The self is the individual being, their identity and consciousness, while the other represents those beyond our individual selves. So this view emphasizes that one cannot genuinely move toward the other unless one assumes the self is distinct from the other. It's like relationships between two countries. They must recognize each other as distinct entities before they can engage in diplomatic negotiations. But the separation of existence doesn't indicate isolation. On the contrary, it forms the basis for the genu genuine interactions and relationship building. If we perceive ourselves as completely integrated with one with the other, we risk overlooking our uniqueness and that of the other. It's like mixing two colors together to create a new one. While the new color may be beautiful, we lose the individual colors that created it. Before the fall, there was distinctions. And with the eschaton, there will still be distinctions, but the distinctions may become blurred by our inner penetration or structural coupling, as Lumen would put it. But we are still distinct entities. Before the fall, there existed a state of optimal communication and consensus. The system, the relationship between God and humanity, functioned seamlessly. Sin disrupted this perfect communion and introduced complexities to which the system has had to adapt. It disrupted the self-referential communication processes between God and humanity, leading to the negativity we experience today. However, redemption and reconciliation through Christ offers means to restore this disrupted communication and consensus to heal the negativity introduced by sin. This does, this does not mean that negativity ceases to exist, but that we gain a framework to understand, navigate, and potentially heal it. It emphasizes the importance of recognizing our individuality, individuality self versus other, acknowledging our sinfulness, the source of negativity, and seeking reconciliation and communication and consensus with God and with each other. To truly progress towards the other, we first need to acknowledge and understand ourselves, our beliefs, principles, and biases. It's like understanding the tools you have in your toolbox before you start a repair. Only by appreciating our unique identity can we genuinely appreciate the uniqueness of the other. To make a conscious move towards understanding and engagement, this synergistic process, which involves man's cooperation with God's grace, necessitates an, an awareness of the self. In this view, the journey towards God, who is the ultimate other, demands a self-awareness, an acknowledgement of our human condition, of our shortcomings, of our need for God's grace. This self-understanding is instrumental in recognizing God's call and responding to it. The struggle with one's sinful mode, the negative, becomes a key part of one's spiritual journey. It's through acknowledging our failings, so that's our self-reflection on sin, wrestling with them, which is engaging the negative negatively, and seeking God's grace and humility and stillness that we grow spiritually. This is a mirror of the hesychastic practice practice of quiet introspection and unceasing prayer, where one seeks to encounter God in the depths of one's own being, amidst one's struggles and contradictions. So in conclusion to all of this, self-awareness and understanding aren't final destinations, but are continuous journeys. The discourse of the self and the other, of subjectivity and consciousness, is as dynamic as evolving as our individual selves. As we wrap up today's episode, I encourage you to keep questioning, keep exploring, and start a conversation in the comments below. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this topic, and if you found this video interesting, please remember to like, share, subscribe for more discussions like this one. Thank you for joining us on this crazy exploration. I am the Economancer. Have a good one.